Um, next week, I invite you to join us for our exercise in walking meditation. What we're going to do is we're going to set up our labyrinth in that room in there, and we are going to have Jeannie Ward here, and we're going to have a wonderful sound experience and an exercise in walking meditation. One thing I have learned in this series is that there are so many ways to practice mindfulness in our own lives. We've talked about some of the exercises. Obviously, meditation is key. Um, so next week is going to be quite fun. Then the week after that, the 17th, we're going to have one of our discussions. Remember the first thing we did when we talked about mindfulness <coughs> is we talked about different mindfulness exercises. And I invited each of you to adopt a practice. Remember? And I said, we're going to talk about it on April 17th. So have we had success in doing that? I was driving along yesterday and I decided the most appropriate practice for me was mindfulness at red lights. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, you can adopt it anywhere. Because remember I talked about reaching for your phone and checking your email? Well, that's me. So I'm trying to be more mindful just in every phase of my life, and that's kind of where I'm focusing. So we still have two weeks. So if you have not adopted a mindfulness practice, and hopefully I'm going to have some time here to talk about some more, please do so, because we're going to talk about it on the 17th, what it's done for us, how it's changed our ability to focus, how it's changed our just our relationship with our own minds and with the world. So please join us for the next two weeks, because it's going to be way fun. So, remember, one of the things I also wanted to do as we go along these series is every series or so, talk about the life of somebody who just exemplifies the values and the virtues we're talking about. So today, I'm going to talk about Siddhartha Gautama, later known as the Buddha, and I'm going to talk a little bit about his teachings and some of his thoughts on mindfulness. So Houston Smith, author of the foundational treatise, The World's Religions, wonderful book. He writes that Buddhism began with a man who woke up. As a matter of fact, the name, the Buddha, means the awakened one, or the enlightened one. The story goes that after his enlightenment, he was approached by a student who asked him, are you God? And he said, no. Are you an angel? And the Buddha said, no. Are you a saint? And the Buddha said, no, I'm not. And the student said, well, then what are you? And the Buddha replied, I am awake. That's it, I am awake. So isn't that the path we're all on? To awakening, to enlightenment, to better knowledge of who we are in this world and our place in it and our relationships to each other. So Buddhism, you know, it's so funny because I have 20 minutes. I usually go over, I will try not to today. But Buddhism is such an extraordinarily rich tradition that there's no way I can even begin to do it justice in 20 minutes. Over time, it's developed different philosophies, different practices, and I just cannot begin to convey the richness of this tradition. So I invite you all to read more about it. We might want to get together and talk about it. Um, I'm going to put some resources up on the website, including some of the resources I've used for this talk and other resources for those who are interested in reading a little bit more about this tradition. The basic facts of the Buddha's biography are these. He was born Siddhartha Gautama in about 563 BC, BCE, in what is now Nepal, near the Indian border. Um, his father was a king back then, really kind of more of a feudal lord, just in charge of a large area back in that time. And he was raised as a Hindu. Buddhism, as you know, grew out of Hinduism. Now the name Hindu back then really articulated a geographic group of people, people who lived in the Indus Valley. It really wasn't a, a religion like we, or a faith tradition as we view it now. But Siddhartha Gautama was raised in the indigenous Indian tradition, which we now call Hinduism. Actually, the word Hindu is of Persian origin, used to identify those that live in the Indus Valley. Isn't it interesting how these words grow up? I love this stuff. Okay, and that's all I inflicted on you. <laughs> it's, it is very fun stuff. Okay, so the story goes that when Siddhartha was born, his father summoned fortune tellers to find out what the fate of this child was going to be. And the fortune teller said, this is an unusual child, and I see an ambiguous future. I see two futures. One, if he accepts the world and he takes his place in the world, he will be a great conqueror. He will be the uniter of India. He will bring all Indian peoples under one banner. The other option, the other future which is potential, is if he renounces the world, he will not become a world conqueror, but he will become a great sage and a world redeemer. And I don't know which one he will pick. And so his father went for plan A. 
And his father decided that he wanted him to be a great king. So no effort was spared to keep the prince in the world. He was given 40,000 dancing girls. He was given wealth. He was, that, I actually saw that number. He was given wealth. He was given luxury. He was given every indulgence that one could have. At the age of 16, he married a beautiful princess. They had a son. His father took pains to guard him from every sight of disease or illness or anything that was not beautiful. He was handsome, he had elephants, his elephants had jewelry. He was a charmed life. <laughs> in any event, in his 20s, he began to experience what we call divine discontent. We've all heard that phrase, haven't we? Mm -hmm. It's that nudge that there is more, that knowledge that this is great, this is great, this is really cool, but there's more out there. And so what he did is he started going out, and he had four outings. They're known as the four great sights. <clears throat> and he saw sickness, he saw age, he saw death. And he didn't know what these are, but he saw an old man, he saw a sick man, and he saw a corpse. And on his fourth outing, he saw a monk with shaved heads and robes and a begging bowl, and he saw that it was possible to renounce this world. Those four sightings absolutely changed his life. He saw that it was an inescapable truth that we would all age, we would become sick, and that we would die. And there was no way around it if we were going to stay focused on this physical plane. He asked himself, life is subject to age and death. Where is the realm of life in which there is neither age nor death? Where is the realm of life in which there is neither age nor death? nor death. So once Gautama had perceived the inevitability of death and pain, he decided to find a way. He decided to set out on a path of awakening and find the greater truth in which there was a life of no age, no pain, and no death. So one night in his 29th year, the story goes, he woke up, he kissed his sleeping wife goodbye, he kissed his sleeping baby goodbye, and he rode off on his white horse. He changed clothes, he changed places, with his um, attendant. His attendant went back and Gautama walked into the forest and began his life of asceticism, denial, and learning. He went through six years. He joined a band of ascetics because he first thought that by abusing his body and by denying his physical nature, that was the path to enlightenment. The story goes that he ate, at most, when he was fasting, six grains of rice a day. And he became so emaciated that when he put his hands on his stomach, he could feel his backbone. However, the problem was he did not gain enlightenment. He almost died, but he did not gain enlightenment. So he adopted what he called the middle way. Has anybody heard of that? The middle way. The middle way is a, is a road halfway between asceticism and indulgence. You take in as much as you need to support yourself, but no more. It is a life of balance and harmony in all things. And that was better, but still it did not lead him to enlightenment. So he continued on his path of mystic contemplation, rigorous thought and study. He kind of had a scientific bent. And he decided that the way to enlightenment was really through his mind. He was going to look at his conscious mind, his subconscious mind, and he was going to look at the deeper level, what Houston Smith and others called the beyond that is within. I just love that image. Don't you love that? The beyond that is within. And isn't that what we try to experience here? I mean, it's so funny as I look at these different traditions, I realize how new thought really applies to all of them. As Buddha, 1,500 years ago, looks for the beyond that is within. So we all know the story. One day he is sitting um, under a fig tree, which has become known as the Bodai tree, and he determines not to get up until he finds enlightenment. His meditation deepened throughout the night. One story goes, he sat there for seven days, and he just said, I am not getting up until I find enlightenment. As the morning dawned, his mind broke free. It was one of those aha moments. And he saw the true nature of the universe and the true nature of himself in it. And what did he see? There are many different stories of what he saw, but most of them articulate that what he saw was that we are all connected. He looked back and he saw his previous lives. 
He saw that he had been born and reborn many, many times, and that life is impermanent, that this separate form is impermanent and it is an illusion, that we are all connected. We are all part of the great reality, that what I do here affects you there, that we are all so joined that we cannot take an action without it affecting the whole. Remember last week I talked about Easter moments, those aha moments? This was one of those moments. When you sit down and you begin to, and you think that you are separate, you are individual, and you just need to awaken yourself, and when you get up, you realize that, no, my awakening is not individual. My awakening is the awakening of the whole, because I am of the whole. That was his insight. Death, he realized, is the separation of this mind from this body, but that's all. We are involved in a countless cycle of births and rebirths and different forms and connection all with each other. He awakened from the belief of a separate personhood, a separate identity, into the knowing that he was a truly unlimited being, that we all are truly unlimited beings, part of the greater reality of our universe. With this awakening, he became the Buddha. He became the awakened one. As the Buddha arose from the Bodhi tree and began his teachings, he did not have the thought of communicating a theology or even a philosophy. There's a lot of questioning out there whether Buddhism is even a religion, whether it's a faith tradition. The Buddha was not a metaphysician. He was not interested in the nature of God, life after death, the battle between good and evil. If people asked him those questions, he would all say, that is not useful and he would just dismiss it. He embarked upon what is known as the Great Silence. You know, all these theological debates we have now, angels dancing on a head of a pin? He did not even do that. He said what is important is the practices. He did not worry about what would happen to us after death. He, he worried about alleviating suffering right here and right now. It's a very, it, it, it's quite simple. He did not embark on all these great dissertations of metaphysics. He was worried about solving the problem of human suffering right here and right now. All these theological debates merely distracted us from what was important. His goal was to convey his insight about liberation from human suffering. So, he gets up from the tree and he starts to walk. His first lesson was given a few miles down the road to five disciples who he had previously been teaching. And in this talk, he set out the essence of his teaching known as the Four Noble Truths. Has anybody heard of the Four Noble Truths? Okay, a few of you have. The essence of Buddhist practice is found in the Four Noble Truths. Now, you'll notice that if you study Buddhism, and I encourage you to do that, um, there are lots of principles which are numbered. The Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Four Foundations of Mindfulness, the Five Hindrances, and you ask yourself, why are there all these numbers? Well, Buddhism was an oral tradition. And so when you, nothing the Buddha said was written down for over a hundred years. So when you're passing on an oral tradition, it helps to have it articulated in a way that you can remember. If you're trying to remember the noble truth and you've only got three of them, that's a hint. You're missing one. <laughs> so this is helpful. So the four noble truths. The four noble truths are these. The first noble truth is that life is suffering. Now, when I first heard this, I thought, man, who wants to follow this tradition? Life is suffering? Thanks. But actually, Buddhism is very optimistic. It, it says that the way we live life is suffering. The way we approach life, the way we think of life, causes suffering in us. The truth is that it doesn't need to. The Buddha meant that life, as most of us live it, is out of joint. It's dislocated and it's painful. Our true nature is not that way. So the first noble truth being that life is suffering really is the good news because we can change it. The second noble truth is that the cause of suffering is desire and ignorance. The Buddha really was quite scientific. The second, what he did is he said, there is suffering, this is what causes it, and this is how to fix it. The cause of human suffering is attachment and desire and ignorance. And here's what he meant by that. We fear death because we don't know what it involves. We wish to remain alive. We fear sickness. We fear loss of our possessions. We want possessions. 
We are consumed by what our ego minds want, what we desire, and what we fear, aren't we? Isn't that the first default position we go into? What I want, what I need, what I'm scared of, that's how we're wired. And maybe it's because back then saber-toothed were ch tigers were chasing us around, I don't know. But that is how we are wired. So when we become attached to things, we fear their loss. We fear their removal, we fear their passing. The truth that he taught is that all this goes. Whatever we are attached to is going to be a cause of suffering because at some point it is going to go. Is it not? Yes, it is. We wish for wealth, possessions, position, and all of it can be lost. Whatever feeds the illusion that we are separate gives us pain. Whatever feeds the illusion that my gain is your loss feeds us pain. True joy comes from a life in which we know we are connected, we are of the whole, and we are living with compassion toward ourselves and to all others. Because that is the truth of who we are. The last two noble truths. The third one is, is that there is a way to end this suffering. There's suffering, there's a cause, and you can end it. The fourth noble truth is the way to end the suffering, and that's what the Buddha called the Eightfold Path. Remember, we're back to numbers. It's the Eightfold Path. Now, I'm not going to talk about every step on the Eightfold Path, but what they really are is a means of intentional living. What the Buddha saw is that most of us live randomly. We live impulsively. We are driven toward pleasure. We are driven away from pain. He said, okay, that is one option. Another option is to live with intention, to live with focus, to live with concentration, training our minds so that we live in a way that brings us happiness or we live in a way that avoids suffering. The Eightfold Path is a means of intentional living. Much in the way he lived, that brought him awakening. As a matter of fact, he said, if you follow the steps of the Eightfold Path, you will achieve awakening. It's not easy, but in six years in the forest, doing everything he did, that was not easy. But that was what was needed for him to achieve awakening. So, the seventh step on the Eightfold Path is right mindfulness. And that's what I want to talk about a little today. Actually, let me take a little deviation here. Oh no, it's Melanie taking deviation. The very first step on the Eightfold Path, the thing that is the assumption of the Eightfold Path, is called right association. And as I look out at you guys, I just have to bring that up, because that is what we're doing. Right association is the notion that we are lifted up by the people with whom we associate. That if we associate with the people who live lives of compassion and joy and love, we will do that too. And so, we are taking the first step on the Eightfold Path just by being in this community, in this Sangha and we move into the rest of the path, and we can talk about the other steps later. But what I want to talk about now is right mindfulness. It's at the heart of Buddhist practice. He wrote, or he said, this is the one-way path for the purification of beings, for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentations, for the passing away of pain and dejection, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of nirvana. Bliss, awakening, is nirvana. So the principal method of practicing mindfulness, as we know, is meditation. It always comes back to that. Sitting in meditation, sitting in the silence to, to know our mind, to train our mind, and to free our mind. To gain insights about what we are meditating on, to gain insights about ourselves. Buddhist nun and teacher Pema Chodron writes that there are four qualities that are cultivated when we meditate. The first is steadfastness. Isn't that a great word? Steadfastness. Steadfastness teaches us to simply stay with whatever happens. How many times if you're like me, you sit down and meditate, you get restless, you get angry, you get bored, and all of a sudden, there's things to do. And you get up. Has anybody ever done that show of hands? Yes. Okay. Steadfastness is the quality that lets us stay and sit. If we do that, if we remain with our experiences, we observe them come and go. That is when we gain insight into what our mind is doing, what we're thinking, what we're feeling. We watch these thoughts come and go. And we learn that we can stay with our experiences. What a valuable lesson that is. 
as we try to go toward pleasure, go away from pain, what a wonderful lesson that we can stay with our experiences and just watch them pass. That is truly a step on the path to awakening. We learn to stay through what she calls our inherent restlessness. The second quality is clear seeing. Clear seeing teaches us to come back to the present moment and to clearly see whatever is in it. Our emotions, our impulses, whatever is coming up, our fears, our desires, whatever is coming up, if we sit with it and stay with it, we are able to clearly see. It's inevitable. If we sit with something long enough, the illusions are going to fall away. Don't you experience that? And at the end of the day, what you see is what is truly there. We see our negative impulses, our negative emotions. We also see our bravery, our wisdom, and our insights. That is clear seeing. The next quality she writes about is that of experiencing our emotional distress. This is painful when we first sit down. You know, they say that meditation is always fun and we get better and it's wonderful. It's not. Sometimes it is downright scary. Sometimes it is very distressing. Have you ever had experiences like that? <coughs> when you sit and it's just not a happy day. But if we learn to stay with those difficult emotions, we learn that they come and they go. We take that energy, we just sit through it, and we watch it dissipate. There is nothing more valuable than that because then it does not control us, it does not scare us, it doesn't drive us. We observe it, we go, there it is, and we just watch it go by. The final quality she identifies is attention to the present moment. Again, remember when we talked about mindfulness, the key thing is attention to the present moment. We make the choice to keep our attention here and now. Such focus is necessary for our ability to love, to feel compassion. If you're talking with somebody, if you are attempting to deeply listen to somebody, can't they tell when your mind is 20 miles away? Haven't you been on the phone with somebody? I have. And they'll say, I gotta hang up, I know you're doing something. It's like, busted. <laughs> you know, I'm typing. My sister's done it. I'm typing, I'm reading, I'm talking, I'm doing something. That quality conveys. What is necessary is attention to the present moment. Keeping here, keeping now, because who said it? The most important face is the one directly in front of you. We can bring compassion and love and joy. So, there are other practices which foster mindfulness. One of them is called gathas. Gathas are, con are short mindfulness verses, and they are contained in a book that Thich Nhat Hanh wrote called Present Moment, Wonderful Moment. And I'm not going to take the time to talk about gathas now, but um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some out there. And what they are is ways just to remember what we are doing in the present moment. Um, as you get up, you can say a short verse. As you eat a meal, you can say a short verse. And these practices encourage us to remain mindful in the moment. But if you're interested in learning more about gathas, I'm going to put some up on the website, on the blog, so we can talk about them a little more later. So, back to sitting meditation. The Buddha focused upon two different types of meditation. The most common is mindfulness of breathing, which we've already talked about, which is anapanasati, and the loving-kindness meditation which is called Metta Bhavana. The loving-kindness meditation teaches us to develop altruistic love and compassion for ourselves and others. When we do our meditation after the talk, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do a loving-kindness meditation. One begins by focusing loving-kindness on ourselves, and then on a respected other, and then on a beloved other, a beloved family member. And then, this is the kicker, you focus your love and attention on somebody who brings you challenges. I almost wrote someone you don't like. But that's so, <laughs> so let's go with somebody who brings you challenges. And you, you practice sending love and kindness toward that person. And finally, you focus loving kindness on all beings. Simply radiating kindness out to all of life. It's a progression. The lesson being that you have to start with yourself. Because unless you can forgive yourself and love yourself, I know it sounds trite, but there's really not much to give if you can't do that. For those of us who are working on forgiveness issues, and I assume that's all of us because we all do, the loving-kindness meditation is a wonderful, wonderful exercise. So as I close, and before we go into our own meditation, just let me give you this thought from John Kabat-Zinn. 
He writes, mindfulness is about being fully awake in our lives. It is about perceiving the exquisite vividness of each moment. We also gain immediate access to our own powerful inner resources for insight, transformation, and healing. So let's take these into meditation.